There we go. It even tells us. Awesome. Okay. So welcome to Council Club. Uh, it's June 10th. So this is the fourth one we've done. Um, just in case you haven't joined us before, uh, the purpose of Council Club is just kind of to demystify local government, city council specifically, and increase participation. Um, we just kind of study the agenda together. There's no, you know, no hard and fast agenda or rules necessarily. Um, but really, we're just trying to make sure that folks across Omaha are paying attention year round, not just during election season, um, so that hopefully, you know, voter turnout will increase and people will just understand that it's important to vote in local elections. Um, and we also just want to do what we can to kind of remove some of the barriers and shame around participation in um, local politics. So no such thing as a silly question. Um, you know, we're all learning together. Disclaimer, like we're not really experts. We're just nerds who care about this stuff, concerned citizens hoping to um, highlight some of the ways that decisions get made um, or don't get made. And um, yeah, we're also, you know, just kind of trying to hold officials accountable, ask for more out of our representatives. Um, and actually Scott brought up earlier, sometimes we feel like we're being gaslit by the city. Like you didn't see what you thought you said. So it's like almost sometimes feels like a support group of just like commiserating with others who um, care about this kind of stuff. So that being said, um, I guess if anybody has any questions, you can either hit the little raise your hand or since there's not that many of us this time, um, you can just unmute and hop in. Um, but I'm gonna change the, it's already on speaker view. All right, so we have kind of a lot to cover this time because last, I guess it was just, God, I'm having such Monday. a hard time with these days these days, but this week, Monday, was the inauguration of the new city council. So, um, Probably everybody already knows who won, but uh, they just were sworn in and um, there was a lot of like hoopla and kind of pomp and circumstance. There were like prayers and, you know, other political gurus there um, or, you know, I guess I won't talk too much trash about who was there, but <laughs> it was Bacon who gave a little speech um, and then Herbster was there who is running for governor and is horrible. I'll just say that. I feel very comfortable saying that. Um, and his running mate is actually Amy Melton's sister, Teresa Thibodeau. So if you don't know how it's all one and the same and super incestuous there, now you do. Um, and then Dave Heineman was there. It was a packed house. We were going to go and we ended up not. Um, and I'm fine with the fact that we didn't go, but it was kind of interesting. Um, you know, they took their seats um, the next day. And, well, actually, okay, so first of all, there was a little bit of scuttlebutt during the inauguration. Did anybody watch it, by the way? Yeah, it was, it was all right. Um, but there was this like dramatic speech given by Brinker Harding about how they really missed an opportunity to do more with diversity and inclusion when they were electing the president and the vice president of city council. Um, he didn't specifically say it was about that election, but he just made some like weird kind of generalization about a missed opportunity with diversity and inclusion. And actually Naomi and I were texting back and forth like, what is he talking about diversity and inclusion? Like all of a sudden he cares about that. Then it turns out we figure out, oh, it's actually just because he's bummed that um, Melton didn't get elected as president or vice president. So just a little, little fun fact there. Which... Yeah, the, the city council election, vice president, president, fell upon or went um, along party lines. Both votes were four to three and Festerson ran against Milton for the president's seat. And there's three Republicans, so they all voted for Milton. And then Harding ran for vice president. And again, the vote was four to three, so. The elected um, president is Festerson and vice president is Vinnie Palermo. This so, is for two years. Yeah, and it's a two year term. So we'll see what happens in two years. Um, but what was also interesting, so that all happened. And then Tuesday's regular meeting happened the next day. Um, and normally, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but normally seats are laid out chronologically. It'll go from left to right, president, vice president, and then in chronological order. Well, since Brinker and I sometimes call it meltdown, but Melton had a little bit of a tantrum about you know, not winning 
president and vice president, they instructed um, the staff to rearrange the seating chart so that it is petty, but they wanted it rearranged so that the most senior representatives were closest to the president and the vice president. So now they like bucked the norm. And so now it's president, vice president, and then Amy Melton, and then Brinker Harding, and then Don Rowe, and then Juanita Johnson, and then Danny Begley. And so what that does, which again, I think it was just like a weird tantrumy thing that they like wanted to be recognized for their seniority. But so now it's like two Democrats, three Republicans, two Democrats. So it's just kind of something that we noticed um, and that a couple other people had mentioned, hey, did you notice that? What's up with that? So we just wanted to bring it up as just kind of a fun fact. Um, anything else? So at the Monday meeting, um, this kind of leads into uh, Thomas Warren, the new chief of staff. Um, so each of the city, each of the new city council members had a time to do opening remarks. And I, so Tom Warren was there and so was Marty uh, wow. Bialik, the current chief of staff. And I went back and watched it again to see who specifically commented on Thomas Warren and um, Festerson, Harding and Melton both basically said, look forward to working with you. And the vote is not until next week. I think the public hearing is this week. And so they've already said that we look forward to working with um, the new chief of staff, Tommy Warren, that they, they commend, uh, Fesserson commended the mayor on her choice. Um, Mel Melton had actually worked with Chief Warren when he was back in 08, when he was the chief of police. Um, and so we kind of already know how they're gonna vote on um, when it comes to the city council's approval of the chief of staff. Now, it only takes four votes. Um, and so we already have three yeses. Um, and so just kind of looking forward because the public hearing is this Tuesday on the chief, I'm sorry, this upcoming Tuesday on the chief of staff. And there's, at least in the public and in the, in the opposition comments, there was um, this, this talk of double dipping, that he is retired um, and that he is receiving a pension from, his, from the police, from, this, from, his, from the city. Was it 125 million, 125,000? And then 100, his salary would be 100,000. 150. Yeah, so he's about right at a quarter million um, that, we're, that the city is going to be paying him. Um, but one of the opposition letters, or letters in opposition on the current agenda, um, <laughs> it kind of, it says, it, you know, is Omaha, what, what kind of message does this send to the city of Omaha and that, you know, Omaha is better than this. And it's just like, no, we're not, we're not better than this. And the, not only that, but the city, the are, um, three of the members have clearly already decided on how they're gonna vote. And so um, while we think it's important for public commentary, just know that more than likely you're not gonna change three of the city council members' minds that they've already made their mind up even before there's an opportunity for public comment. They don't care what we think um done deal yeah as we know but yeah um and there was the, right now there's only one letter of opposition um and again it just kind of like i think to scott's point it makes you wonder sometimes why you would take the time to weigh in when it's so clearly already been decided um and it's not just in this case it's in like most cases i feel like a lot of times it's hard to feel like you're actually making a difference when you weigh in but i do still think it's important to um write your city council rep or show up um, to talk about it at City Hall on Tuesday. And we're pretty sure the press is going to be there. And so they, they seem to sometimes, um, they'll be there. You can tell they're there for just one agenda item. And they'll set up their cameras. And as soon as that agenda item is over, they tear their cameras down. So I don't I think this one is pretty low. Is it 49? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's so Tom Warren, the new chief of police, is 49. So they're going to be there for a while. And they might turn their cameras on. I think sometimes they're just rolling the whole time. Um, so I, I feel like we've been talking about this, not necessarily addressing our comments to the city council, but just know that this, the cameras, the press is listening and they're always looking for a juicy soundbite. And so um, sometimes it's, I just use them as my muse or just try to, I don't know, not necessarily educate, but inform the press. Um, and just whoever's listening. I mean, you know, yeah. again, I feel like half the time the council's checked out, but 
still sometimes important to just bring up points that maybe wouldn't be thought about. And I think, you know, there was, I want to say there was maybe national press on this um, about how the whole double dipping thing is just like flying in the face of the IRS and they know it's a workaround. And like, is that really the type of example we want to be setting from the mayor's office down? Um, so I don't know, it'll be an interesting one to watch. Uh, we did kind of jump to that one. Um, any questions about anything yet? All right, cool. Um, I guess the other thing, so aside from the seat musical chairs situation, um, Juanita Johnson is now representing District 2, and she, on her first day in office, was able to give a proclamation for Juneteenth. I thought that was just kind of cool for her. Um, other things of note, they um, approved a hotel being turned into senior living in the Old Mill area, which was actually like not the worst thing. You know, senior living is something that I don't think we probably have enough of. Um, Oh, and then I know what I thought was really interesting. Luis Jimenez is not here with us today, but he was at, um, he's been at a few of the council club meetings and we were discussing um, because, you know, we all are trying to make it so that you don't have to give your address at city council and trying to figure out what the latest is with that. Um, we're hearing it's being reviewed by the city law department. We've also heard you have to contact your state senator. Anyway, so Luis decided to be a guinea pig and he went up a few weeks ago and said, 1819 Farnham Street, which is the courthouse building, you know, it's like the city center building. Well, we didn't really think anything of it. You know, they were just like, Louise, we know that's not where you live. Just, and he's, Jerem specifically goes, we already know where you live. It's fine, whatever. So they just let him go on. Well, he got an email from the city attorney um, saying, is it the city attorney Vandenbosch or deputy? Anyway, someone in the law department of the city saying, um, we're not going to give you a misdemeanor charge, but you gave false information to public officials, and that is a misdemeanor. So they gave him a warning. Yeah, they gave him a warning, and they said, "No, no, Louise." Um, anyway, just a fun fact for you. Uh, did a little little testeru there, and yeah, sure enough, they do sometimes know, and they do want you to be. But accurate. speaking of warnings, I I actually um, talked to Larry, Larry Store. He also, he gets, he's probably the most uh, citizen that gets um, called out of order. He's been, I've seen him escorted out of the city council multiple times. He'll sometimes get um, out of order during the Douglas County meeting. And he told me that Claire Duda would sometimes make him leave the building. Um, but he would, they would let him back in at two o'clock for the city council meeting and then get called out of order again. But Larry said he's never gotten a ticket, that he's never been um cited i think he came close he said bullshit the other day and made a little tantrum and jerem said i'm going to cite you for disorderly or disrupting disruption um but i mean if larry hasn't gotten in trouble for all the stupid stupid stuff he said um and all the times he's been out of order i feel like it's pretty much um i mean it also kind of depends on also festerson how festerson being the president is going to run meetings yeah, because he's the one that's sort of, he's, yeah, the one in, in charge. charge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought that was interesting that Larry, yeah, <laughs> has never gotten in trouble for all this stuff he's done. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, Larry, ugh, I didn't go talk to him because I, anyway. All right. So um, before we jump into some other just like line items that jumped out, I know, Brian, last week we had talked about doing a little bit of um, kind of like tracking results and stuff. So do you, I know you said you maybe had some results reporting. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. <laughs> or we can come back to you or whatever. Um, no, so. Maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> I don't know what it looks like yet because we haven't done enough of this. So I just went through a spreadsheet and listed all the uh, line items and then calculated. So I divided it into what I thought were appropriate sections. So there's a planning section that had 12 line items representing seven projects, all voted for, seven zero. Okay. The next one was the liquor license section, four items voted seven zero. Though uh, Festerson did talk to the person who wanted to have the outdoor festival um, somewhere in was off it Benson people and um, it's actually just outside it's kind of off of um, 
88th and Maple. Okay. It's um, by the Keystone Cafe where there's been some issues lately there too. It's like, it's in that little strip mall kind of by some residences. And so, yeah, they talked about how they offered to buy a um, hotel room for the neighbors that had small children during that festival time. So I guess they were trying to show that they were making an effort to do what they could for their neighbors. But yeah, other than that, I, th I think it'll, did they pass it? Yes. Yeah, all four of them, yeah. Yeah. all four liquor license uh, requests went through. The consent agenda. So this is just a fun one to pick apart because some of them are first readings, final readings, second readings kind of things. So the ordinances, three of them, they were all voted at the same time. They did. They don't vote separately. All right. three of them, they're seven zero. Mm -hmm. The resolutions, again, twenty items voted seven zero. They let people speak for or against all of them but then voted 7-0 on just one fell swoop. Yep. And sometimes uh, they do pull stuff off the consent agenda to talk about it a little bit more, but- And to vote not, separately. Yeah, but not, not this not time. very often, yeah. Uh, everything on the final reading, one item. Probably weren't a lot of final readings because they knew that they were transitioning. So the one final reading this week was voted 7-0. Second readings though, all voted 7-0. So <laughs> I was like, act like something's going to happen. We know 7-0. Right. Okay. Um, and then the non-action items, this is the part where I thought that there would be the most discussion because this is the opportunity to say something and not actually have to do anything about it this time. All non-action items, they didn't even really consider them. They, they didn't even read them. They just said, okay, and the non-action items and then took a 7-0 and then dismissed. It was a pretty quick meeting, yeah. Yeah, they really didn't care about any of the items this week. Minor discussions at best. Yeah, yeah. I almost regret not standing up and saying something about, there was like a grant for, um, I don't know specifically, I didn't read through it uh, entirely, but with domestic violence reporting, which I know um, they were getting a grant for like the women, I should go look, and look at it, but um, there was also a story recently about how Nebraska has not been compliant. Oh, okay. It's it was similar, yeah, to enhance victim assistance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So victim assistance, um, the stop true. violence against women, women grant. Yeah. Line um, 48. Yes. And, um, I, I don't know. I just felt like they don't really do a good job of reporting domestic violence. I just wanted to kind of tie that together and be like, okay, you're getting money to do this. Are you actually going to do it the right way now? But I didn't. Um, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the entire, every vote was seven zero. Yeah, they they didn't miss a beat. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I mean just in our time of like watching it closely, like I I feel like ninety nine percent of the meetings are seven to zero. Every once in a while, you'll get a few dissenting votes, um, like with the Medica and. Um... Blue Cross Blue Shield yep. issue where like they gave a personal check instead of a cashier's check or something like that, that split. Um, but yeah, for the most part. So it'll be interesting if you're going to continue tracking it. That's awesome. It'll be fun to kind of see if that deviates much or if it's just rubber stamp city. And then also I, one thing I, I started to make a similar spreadsheet and I can share the first one. Um, what I did is I, uh, I, I went and I time coded or I all, all of the, excuse me, all the points on the agenda, um, I added a YouTube link to the, um, to the city council meeting video. So if you, uh, I got the idea from Council Bluffs. If you just type in, or if you search for something on the Council Bluffs city council agenda, it takes you, the city website takes you right to, it, it already has the time code built in. So I feel like this is something that .com should be doing automatically. Um, but if something is, if you wanted to, if you wanted more work to do, um, or just something that I thought actually might be useful would be like, oh, I want to see when do they talk about, you know, this liquor license at the, at the 80th and Maple, just or for, for whatever reason, just so they, and also that it's searchable, because right now it's not searchable. Um, so are you saying go into the YouTube comments and post them as timestamps there? Well, so uh, I, th they turn comments off. So I was gonna, I was gonna do oh, my course. first time. I was thinking just for our, for our spreadsheet and for the one that you're working on, I could um, 
in addition to including votes and breaking it down into line items, um, just adding a column that says, okay, this is when, uh, yeah, this is the time code on the YouTube link. And YouTube allows you to link to a, to a video with a, with a timestamp on it. Um, I can show you how to do that. Or I can show you, I did one, I think for a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, you just put T equals seconds at the end. Yep, exactly. Yeah, this, this past meeting though, you know, 20 items in, in one minute, they barely read them. Exactly. And so if I would, I grew, I made, yeah, I just had one big block that said, okay, this whole thing was just for one or one timestamp for 20 items. Yeah. No, it's um, not ideal, but, and then another thing would be, um, I don't know how this it's, <laughs> would be just to have a, a column with all the money and departments specifically, how much money is the police getting? Um, That's, I just went and pulled the PDF into a spreadsheet. So at yep. the end, if you want, I'll give you the share link for this. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Nerds unite. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All for the sake of transparency, because it's like, it's so hard to keep track of all this stuff and they're not really doing anything to help us out. So we will help ourselves. All right. Cool. Um, anything else? Hi, Dave. We're just, uh, you know, fast and casual as per usual. Um, all right. So on this coming Tuesday's agenda, did anything jump out to anybody reading through it? Um, otherwise, we'll just kind of go through and pull out or, the ones. Or just that... say Thomas Warren and get that line item out of the way now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, since we did already talk about that, that's item number 49. Um, does anyone want to share their thoughts on if you think that's legit or not? The uh, double dipping chief of we'll staff. We'll just say the obvious. There's not much we can do. We already know how the vote's going to go. No, I think he's a fine guy and I admire a lot of the work he's done, but it's like, really, there's nobody else who hasn't already had a lengthy city career <laughs> we could tap. Yep. Well, he's, he's also another link between Stoppard and the police. Exactly. Which yeah. is very important for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, this um, the one the one letter of opposition that was submitted is short and sweet, and it kind of echoes your point, Lori. He's maybe he's not a bad guy, but the policies related to double dipping at the city need to be eliminated once and for all, not paraded in front of the entire city. The city has a history of allowing employees to retire, be rehired, and in the process collect two paychecks. It smacks of a good old boy network and is morally wrong. Stothard's condoning of this practice is wrong. If the city council approves this, they would be derelict in their duties. At a minimum, Warren's pension salary should be suspended while employed again. Otherwise, the city is, in effect, condoning double dipping, a questionable practice at best. Omaha is better than that, or is it? So, yeah, that's right, kind of what we all they're think. Not they're not hiring him. They're contracting with his LLC. Right. LLC, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and, That's their workaround. I mean, it. that's their fancy way of... And for anybody watching this video without going back to the PDF, the name of the LLC is Thomas <laughs> H. Warren, LLC. Right. Yes. Completely different. Very clever. I, I also want to say that I'm late because I was watching episode eight of Underground Railroad. So. All right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> we don't judge here, Dave. It's a, it's a shame free space. Well, it's, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing to watch and then come talk about the Omaha City Council. Yeah, I suppose the juxtaposition <laughs> of the two would be interesting. good. All right. Well, now we got the that exciting double dipping number 49 off. The one that blew my mind today was number 39 about park rules. Um, those of you who have been paying attention to mode shift and just like what we've been talking about for a while is how the city was trying to ban e-bikes on park trails. Um, they did the same thing that they're doing now. It was a consent agenda item said park rules. I was like, oh, I wonder what they're doing with park rules. Click the attachment, clicked another, you know, it was like buried, but they were attempting to ban e-bikes on park trails. Um, e-bikes are super popular. It's hot and hilly here. They're the perfect solution for the topography and just challenges of getting around Omaha. Um, they're just like a hugely popular, quickly growing segment of the bike populate or, you know, segment. Um, and they were just going to try to just sneak it right through and just ban them from the trail. So we went to city council, spoke out against it. They pulled it from the consent agenda. The parks department had also already created misspelled recreation, but created and installed signs that banned e-bikes before it was even rubber stamped by the council because they you know, probably just saw it as a silly formality, um, assumed 
probably seven to zero, sure, consent agenda, just push it on through. Well, we got it pulled um, and then met with the parks department and um, realized that they were attempting to ban e-bikes, even though the complaints that they had received involved gas powered vehicles and people passing others too quickly, um, which we then found Strava users, which are just, you know, people that are training on the trails going 38 miles an hour. It's like, this is not an e-bike specific problem. It's about etiquette and it's about, you know, maybe gas powered, maybe ban gas powered things if that's your issue. Um, maybe talk about a speed suggestion if that's the issue. So anyway, gratefully they rewrote the rules, um, but now they're trying to put our, you know, like parks are closed, including trails, which trails are transportation. This is why this fired me up is because it's like, what if you work an overnight shift? You know, there's a lot of equity issues involved when you're just gonna say, oh, you can't be on the trails between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. I know that maybe it won't be enforced, but the fact is if it turns into law, it can be. And we know that a lot of times enforcement doesn't look the same depending on what color your skin is. So um, I have been in communication with the parks, um, he's not even the director, Dennis Breyers, he works in the parks department um, and said, hey, this is a problem. And a couple other folks on this email thread, some other advocates were like, yeah, this is a problem. Um, Bike Walk Nebraska, this is a problem. And then we didn't hear anything back from Dennis, but then I see it pop up today on the consent agenda. And I'm like, no, you're not gonna do this again. Like, why is this so difficult for you to understand? Like, you're not gonna be able to just do these types of things without pushback. So I would encourage everyone to email your city council rep and say, trails are for transportation and recreation, sure. But please do not limit the hours. I count on them for transportation. Well, and every time bike transportation by you know using a bike for transportation comes up with these folks they cite the trails as part of the transportation network so called yeah so it's like okay it are you going to define it as recreation use only or is it part of a transportation network it's whatever serves them at the time right but, i know I, yeah. mean, I know the answer to the question it just pisses me off <laughs> no but like the city's yeah. own website has the bike own, uh, bike network map and it includes the trails and sarah brought up if the um the wayfinding signs that is also on the city of omaha's website the wayfinding signs point you to the trails for transportation and it's just like it, it doesn't say anything about only 11 to 5 8 11 yeah that they're closed or anything but yeah, that someone needs to tell the mayor that the trails are not for trans, or the trails are just for recreation or vice right. versa. Well, when they when they took the money to build the trails from the federal government under the ICT program, they're required to build them according to certain standards which support transportation and to maintain them as transportation corridors. I mean, this was all done back in the 80s and 90s when the majority of it was built. Um, I was pretty deeply involved in that process at the time. And uh, so you can't, without violating federal law, you can't just shut down the trails for transportation and call them recreation, because they're not. They were built with the understanding that they would be transportation. transportation. That, that's how we got the 80-20 money to build the things in the first place. That is excellent. And uh, after I got that email from you highlighting that, Dave, I also emailed Eric Williams with the NRD, who does a lot of, you know, he's in charge of a lot of the trails as well, um, because I wasn't getting a response from Dennis. Um, and so it'll be interesting to hear what his thoughts are on that, too. But yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not letting this one go. Um, and hopefully others will chime in as well and push back. Yeah, on I'll, this because... I'll send Brinker an email um, yes. tonight. Great. That's excellent. Yeah. I think if like we all just like start getting in a habit of just regularly emailing our reps, they will know that we are going to, you know, keep bringing them issues and hopefully, um, I don't know. I don't know. And one of, so a good jaded. example to kind of juxtapose um, is there's a, the Elmwood Park has a, tra has a trail and also has a road that goes through it. The road stays open. The road, even though Elmwood Park closes at 11 o'clock, the road for cars for trans cars transport transporting themselves um, stays open, and even uh, Julie Harris at Bike Walk Nebraska was sort of using Elmwood Park as an example and being like, if you if you don't close the street down, then why are you closing the trail down? So if they can if they can make an exception for car lanes, they can make an exception for tr for bike trails as well. Right. The PDF here says that the vehicles are allowed through Elmwood, Hummel, and Heflinger yep. are the three exceptions. Yep. 
And then any person or organization that requests a modification of said closing times and such modification is approved by the city council. So I guess they're just doing the not it game and saying, okay, it's up to the council, maybe. So we can say, okay, city council approve use 24 seven by trail users for transportation. And maybe that'll do it. I don't really know, but it's definitely something that we are going to be following up on. Um, and then the, the drones one, I wanted to look up, it's rule number 14. Um, I was surprised that last time Amy Melton, I believe uh, Standing Bear, it, uh, park is in her district and there is there is a model airplane runway at standing bear i yes. don't and so and she was surprised um that none of the drone operators and i think she even said that there's a drone class and i'm not sure this is i don't know if there's a if, if they're differentiating between model airplanes and drones i think to the lay person they're a little flying remote control toys um and but the, there was no opposition last time so i think there's going to be some i feel like melton might even say something this time so rules there banning drones at all parks so that would mean i i think they literally would have to take the runway out of standing bear or stop having classes there uh, um yeah we'll see all right any other thoughts on park rules before we move on the trail on the trail trees kind of similar. oh yeah yeah a little bit less depressing um number 39 is about um trees on the turner boulevard trail oh, that's park rules i think it's up high i think it's 31. 31. Um, nope <laughs> thought i had them below right there anyway something about park trees oh 36. Okay, so yeah, basically just saying that um, they're going to install some trees, um, almost twenty five thousand dollars worth of trees on the um, along including the silver maples, which is so mm -hmm. stupid. But don't even get me started on the plant selection. Give us the quick why why so why are silver maples bad? because silver maples are popular because they're fast growing. And so they do provide shade, you know, at a at a quicker rate than something like an oak, um, like a native oak would, you know, there should be more of those everywhere. Um, but silver maples essentially rot from the inside, and then they become hazards and have to be they they either fall down in a windstorm causing damage or they have to be taken out so you know after i don't know 30 years or so um i mean we've had some on our block that have been you know knocked over in a windstorm and they literally just hollow themselves out as they age um you know not necessarily because of insect infant infestation or anything like that they just that's how they age yep. and um so they're just a poor choice and i i looked specifically at the at the attachments for that and i saw that the you know the low bid contractor got the or low bid got the contract um i didn't see numbers on you know which trees how many of which trees were you know which species were going to be planted but um but i think i don't know it's this is like one of my weirdo things so i don't no, it's know your, it's your special, it's your, your, i would consider you an expert on this that's and also i would consider dennis briars who we've been talking about the park rules he's a landscape architect i feel like this should yeah be i think we should bring it up to him be like these are not good tree choices and you know this and you went with the cheapest of course well, that's what I was gonna say. This is once again, uh, an example of just choosing the low bid because price wins all when in fact, it's probably not the best choice. Maybe it's not the worst contract, but maybe it is the cheapest for a reason. And in the long term, it might cost us more money because we're just making a quick decision based on the lowest price tag without actually thinking about it thoroughly. And which is <coughs> potholes. <coughs> <laughs> 36. Yeah, number 36. So what May is doing the North Omaha Trail? Yeah, which okay. is not not happening quite well, yet. If, if Manny's Manny... listening, don't get maples on your trail, Manny. <laughs> it's going to be all maple trees. <laughs> <laughs> Only <No>. silver <laughs> maples. It's a trial. 
silver maple. No, 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 let's do pocket prairies all along. I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't think there'll be any maples. Red buds, maybe. Um, I don't know. There's options. We'll get to that when we get to it. So nice. Cool. Hi, Manny. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Hey. Um, we were just talking about the Turner Boulevard trail trees um, and how park rules is. And so, well, it actually, um, and we were talking, I don't know if you were here, Manny, but we talked, we kind of jumped ahead and we're talking about the park rules specifically. They are allowing e-bikes um, and this, and this, the public hearing is this Tuesday or next Tuesday and they're going to vote on it. Um, but then uh, our big deal is that the parks are closed uh, from 11 to 5, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Would that be the same with uh, the trail you're working on? I mean, we haven't talked about that. So I would probably not before that because how are you going to enforce that number one, you know? Well, and also why would you enforce that when people use it for transportation and not everyone works at fucking nine to five? Oh, I said yeah. that. Was gonna but yeah, it's just, I don't know. Hopefully it will get Stopped. I would just question, like, what is the reason? Was there like some incident that happened, or you know, like, is it just like one thing happened, so we're doing this for everything? I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm not really a big supporter of that in any way. So, no, and the one exception is Elmwood Park has a car lane that remains open, <laughs> but the, the the trail does not, and the park itself, and you can't play golf at midnight. Obviously, it's dark out. But for people going to school or coming home from going back and forth on the dorms at UNO, like they yeah. would technically be in violation of being in a closed park at night. Um, you know what I bet it's for? If it's for parks, I bet it's for homeless people or people that have houses. Um, it's right. My guess of why they would be doing it. Yeah. Which is, is a whole nother issue that probably yeah. should be solved instead of just not allowing people in the yeah. park. Yeah. Yeah, but also specifically focusing on transportation corridors, like, I don't know. Yeah. I finally did hear back from Dennis because um, I have emailed him a few times saying, this is not okay, what's going on? And he was like, oh, okay, well, we're going to be reviewing it. And I was like, well, then why did you already send it to city council? Like, it's already on their consent agenda. So, like, maybe get it straight before you send it for council approval, but we'll see. And we also, just side note, we saw our first Lime scooter today in Benson. It showed up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so I'm glad that you mentioned that because I saw my first scooters today just because I've been a hermit and I haven't been downtown since Tuesday or whenever they were put out. Mm. And so I saw them and um, my concern is there's none in North Omaha, so I don't know what that's about. They specifically um, were supposed to put them. I haven't seen them. I, I Maybe I missed where they put them, but I didn't see any on 24th Street, so... I'm happy to reach out to Derek at Spin and be like, tell me where they are in North O. Yeah. And you know, I, I would down, I downloaded the app just to see where they were placed. And they definitely, in their RFP, it had specific North Omaha. I, I believe even reduc reduced rates. Yeah. In, for North Omaha. Yeah. Maybe I missed them. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I just wasn't looking because I was doing other stuff. But um... I don't know. I feel like they're hard to miss. I feel like you would have seen them. Well, we'll look. <laughs> That's a good thing to be aware of. We'll, we'll, uh, Maybe text me if you do end up seeing them. Otherwise, I'll send them to spin. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my eye out for them okay. uh, intentionally next time I'm that way. I usually am just like e-bike. All right, I'm good. So yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. And scooters are allowed on the trails too. Speaking of trail rules, they updated it to say e-bikes are allowed and e-scooters are allowed. Um, so yeah. All right, cool. Um, anything else from anybody before we move on to TIFF? The magic word everyone looks forward to. Mm -hmm. um, nothing. Okay, cool. All right. So, number forty-seven is TIFF for the Mastercraft, um, and these are uh, ordinances on their second reading. So this is number forty-seven. So there is a public hearing this coming Tuesday, um, and it's a significant amount of money. Not as big as some we've seen, but. Um, one and a half million in TIF request. Um, there it's is significant considering they're only talking about 11,000 to 15,000 square feet. And I like the idea of, even though it's privately owned, but public green space of a little over an acre. 
Um, Lori, I know you office right out of, over there. Do you have any feelings about what's happening with the Mastercraft? Well, I have, I think generally the development is a good thing for that neighborhood. I, you know, I do have some problems with TIFF, but, but I, you know, I think until they enforce some, uh, like have some conditions that are not now in place for TIFF that, you know, they're, the developers are just getting all the benefits they can. And the, the um, I will say that uh, the Millwork Commons folks are pretty good neighbors in the sense that they sent out a survey um, to all of us at Hot Shops um, asking about what kinds of um, plantings and activities we'd like to see in that park. Um, you know, absolutely planning for the idea that it'll be a community resource, not just for the people who live and work in their particular development. So um, I really like that. And they, um, they are um, working, I think they're working with Mulhalls to do the landscaping and they are incorporating a lot of native plantings and um, have some kind of interesting um, water management um, systems put in place. So, um, I mean, I, I like the idea of having a park, you know, just yeah. a block away yeah. um, from my studio. Um, I don't necessarily think they should be getting this big financial break to install it, but, you know, they're, that, that's how the rules are set right now. And so why not take advantage of the benefit if you have the resources to do that? Yeah, and I think this is a classic case of where like the developer went to the city and said, I would like this to be blighted, please. And then can get TIFF because of that. Um, maybe it wasn't this specific one. I, I don't know, I feel like this was, oh, maybe they went, I don't know. It happens know. a lot more than, what's that? Oh, I, I was just, go ahead. I was just going to, I have some thoughts I'll save for me. Share them. No, bring it. Okay. Now's All right. Time. Well, as far as blighted, I mean, it's close, obviously close to the ballpark and that sort of thing, as we call it in Omaha, the ballpark yeah. and, that, and that whole area. But like what's around it? I mean, it's just an old industrial area. So I can understand why they have it as a blighted area and, you know, it, more so than Blackstone, yeah. Oh yeah, and, and there's yeah. not housing over there. So like, how can you make it more, uh, you know, um, I guess a better place for people to live at and stuff like that. So I get that. And then as far as like um, the publicly owned or privately owned public space, I mean, I, I get the inherent, like, you know, it's not technically public, but also the parks are closing at <laughs> 11 o'clock. So what's the difference? in some ways. And then I also think about, you know, maintenance and such like that. Like, you know, I get why it's better to have it publicly owned, but then at the same time, are the publicly owned things we have right now being taken care of as well as privately owned things. And if they're being closed at 11 to five, you know, I don't know. Those are just my thoughts and opinions. I don't really have a, a solution. <laughs> well, that's good. So, I like it. Thank you for sharing. Any other shot shots, thoughts that want to be shared? I just had a problem with the whole idea of blighting a property for an existing property owner to then get money to redevelop. The original idea behind blight was dereliction of duty on a property owner or through abandonment that an area has fallen through to where a city then has to take over and usually turn it over to a new owner. They buy the land, redevelop it. But for a single property owner to have their own property blighted and then get assistance to turn their own property into something, just kind of opens the can of worms that I'm gonna let my property fall through just because. I'm not gonna take care of this for the you, next 10 years. You don't even have to not take care of it. All you have to do is get the designation that it's blighted. It can be in perfectly good condition and get designated as blighted if the city council chooses to do so. So if you just wanna change the purpose of your property and get the tax break to do it, you can get the city council to approve it. So yeah. you, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to jump well, through a I, bunch of dilatory I, I, I think dilatory Lower hoops. Commons is in the area that was just very recently 
um, further designated as extremely blighted. Um, so, you know, it's like this, this new overlay that, you know, I think is paving the way for, I mean, cause the, that I, I remember seeing the maps that the folks from planning presented a few weeks ago. And I mean, it stretches from that, that you know, the area around hot shops and millwork commons um, all the way down to, well, where they're gonna build the new casino. God. You might as well run it all the way up to Carter Lake while you're there. If you let me share my screen, I have the map of the CRA area, which is technically all the blighted areas in Omaha, which I think the C, the, and the reason why they did the extremely blighted is you'll see why. <laughs> um, because the CRA map or the blighted areas in Omaha, uh, whoa, you gave me all the responsibilities here. I'm yeah, gonna, I feel like whole, sometimes whole. I can just do like a allow sharing of screen, but it didn't let me do it that time. So I just gave you or the power. You manage. could just do co host. Yeah. <laughs> Usually it says that. I didn't see it this time. I don't know. Anyway, I'm fine with this. But this, <laughs> this is the CRA map. So this is the blighted areas in Omaha, technically. So you can so see it does go up to Carter Lake. Yeah, parts of it. Well, the. Okay, Nebraska I'm sorry. Part. Remind me what CRA stands for. Uh, community re redevelopment. Oh, yeah. Area. Okay. So, I see it. Thank you. So, but these are the blighted areas. So every, you know, all, it's a lot. This is so much, you know, in Blackstone and uh, Exarbin's in there and, you know, all these different sort of things. So the, the reason for the extremely blighted, I don't have that map as readily. I just Googled this one, but the extremely blighted is to kind of narrow that down and help focus. So it's not just everyone do whatever you want if you're essentially in east of 72nd, right? Uh, or in Exarbin. So which makes more sense. But um, yeah, that's I think that's kind of one of the in, inherent problems with this is that they just have such a wide area that's eligible. And, you know, and then other, there's not, no, you don't have to do like affordable housing or things like that. But That's all I got. I'm doing my posting <laughs> capabilities. Um, no, that's, yeah, that's interesting when you just see how much of the city is blighted. Um, and just the whole thing with TIF is, of course, developers are going to get whatever they can out of the system. My understanding is between the planning board and the city council, those are the players that should say, uh, yeah, you technically crossed all the T's and dotted your I's, but this is not good for the community as a whole. And yes, in 15 years, we will see an increase in the tax, but blah, blah, blah. But well, right the thing, now- The thing to do is, is track, track the uh, political campaign contributions right. by the receivers of TIF to the city council here. That was getting uh, highlighted a little bit leading up to the last election who was, you know, where follow the money, as we say, you know, right. like, yeah, watch, watch where the money goes. Whether or not there was some altruistic motive in the creation of TIF in the first place in some, you know, part of the universe, the way it's being applied, especially in Omaha, is to move money, okay, move money from pot A into pot B. And the people that are, re that are moving the money uh, are benefiting from it financially and in terms of maintaining a political power base. So, you know, to go and, and complain about this to the people that are involved in the process um, doesn't carry a lot of weight with them. So the, the only way to resolve the problem is to manage somehow to vote them out of office. So vote, voting, voting is the way uh, to get progressives onto the council and the mayor's office and to stop the crap. And once again, that is the point of this group so that we all are paying attention year round mm -hmm. instead of just leading up to the election so that then we are motivated to talk with our friends more frequently about what's happening at City Hall and the importance of electing good people. Um, and then Dave, I don't know if you were here last week when I asked, does anyone recall a TIF project that, was, that did not get the award? I've heard that Palandino was denied a TIF project, but I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. Yeah. Be another yeah. spreadsheet, Brian. Track all the <laughs> allotments that get rubber stamped right on through without. I mean, it's it's again, it's that not it game. I mean, Scott and I were talking earlier about how we saw um, someone 
uh, it was like a development out West and everyone, like all the West Omaha moms wore red and like tried to make a statement in front of the planning board. Like, we do not like this. We're going to wear coordinated outfits in protest. Um, and the planning board director was like, or the, I think, I don't even know who, who it was on the planning board, but someone's like, you can't really, you don't need to bring this to us. There's nothing we can do. We just make sure that the applications are filled out properly. You need to take your coordinated outfits to city council because those are the, the people that will actually be able to stop this um, based on public feedback. We're just really here to rubber stamp it on through is what it sounded like. So unfortunately. But, Tiff goes okay, here's a stupid question. Who, I, I mean, I can look up who's on the planning board, but how do you get to be on the planning board? And I mean, if really all they're doing is looking at the application itself, then how useful is that? I mean, how is that a check and balance if you're just filling out the forms correctly? That, I mean, it doesn't, it's, it's not making sense to me. Well, likewise, are we only seeing things on the agenda? that get past the planning board? Are we seeing the rejects? Where are those going? Well, and I, I think that there's actually um, a new thing that has happened with requesting information about TIF projects. Um, you are now going to have to direct requests about TIF paperwork if you wanna see it before it goes to the planning board. So you could like hypothetically get to it at the earliest stages, you have to submit uh, an open records request. For every TIF project listed, if you want to see it before the planning meeting, which is oh, as if they'll turn that around in a timely manner. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So when we're talking about like transparency and accountability, that's a new thing. Um, but as far as who gets appointed, I, I believe it's the mayor. We think the mayor appoints all the boards: library board, building commission. Um, yeah, there and there, you know, there could be recommendations or whatever, but ultimately, she's kind of got final say. On a lot of it. And Manny used to work in planning. Is there any other information you could lend about the planning board or how that works? No, I think that's that's about all I know. I think it's I think the it's kind of a procedural thing, right? Like it's just while it is, you could say it's just like, you know, making sure the applications are filled out and such, that that you know kind of makes it easier on the council so that they're not then spending all their time trying to do that for every single you know, development across the whole yeah. city and things like that. So, yeah. So the planning board makes sure it's technically acceptable and meets the requirements. And I feel like Bridget Hadley, who works, um, she's on the TIF committee and everything. She, I feel like almost every week she's like, this is a perfect example of a TIF project. And I'm always just like, is there ever going to be not a perfect example of a TIF project? Because to me, it's like, these are not perfect examples. I can't wait to hear her say that about the freaking casino. Hopefully she won't, but. We'll see. <sighs> All right. Um, anything else about that? Otherwise, we'll keep rolling. We're almost done because we're at the top of the hour. Um, I guess uh, we were kind of looking at some TIF stuff. So 47 and 48 um, are TIF projects. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, 47, 48. Um, so 47 was Mastercraft. 48 is 18th and Howard which I guess I just want to quickly talk about parking because that's what I love to talk about. Um, parking minimums and whatnot. I'd like to see parking minimums go away in Omaha. I just found out Kansas City doesn't have parking minimums anymore. Um, but Minneapolis, Minneapolis has deleted them too. Right, it's happening more and more. We'll be the last as, as usual. Maybe not, hopefully not. Um, anyway, they are actually going to be doing 120 to 124 apartments and 20,000 square feet of commercial space. And they're doing 40 parking spots that are off street for their residents. So um, 40 spots for 120 apartments. That's better than what they just did on Dodge Street with the Clove where they built a bazillion parking spots. Like what does transit oriented development even mean if we're gonna build that many parking spots? Anyway, so this one, they're doing 40 off street stalls and then they're actually collaborating with another development to lease 40 more parking stalls. Um, I just thought that was kind of interesting. And then so I'm sure it'll go through as well. That is a significantly bigger number. It's three and a half million in TIF. Um, probably will go through without question. 
Uh, 49 is Tom Warren, which we already talked about. Um, oh, and then they have, um, I just kind of like to pay attention to like SIDs and annexation. I don't know if all of you like to, I don't know. It's hard to know why they just continue to expand and expand. They, they look at a short-term gain, but long-term it is not, it's not good to just continue to sprawl forever. Um, so that there's, is- There's a lot of strong town videos on why that sprawl is just not even economically feasible. In the short term, they'll point to, oh, right here, right here, this is our, we're increasing the tax budget. And then it's like, nope, it's completely unsustainable. Um, I think it's like, they can prove that it's a money maker for like five years or some really short term and correct me if anybody knows otherwise, but then like right afterwards, it just tanks and it's not. No, it's a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Well, it, it also about. depends on, it depends a lot on how much debt you acquire when you uh, annex the new area, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with SIDs, a lot of which are upside down financially yeah. so um that has a lot to do with the money but yeah in the long term sprawl is unsustainable because the the cost per square foot of maintaining it um, exceeds the tax base that you recover yeah and then you have to provide fire and police and well, all yeah that's that's services. part of the deal yeah right. you, you can't you can't recover enough tax to uh to call for all the cover the cost of of uh, supporting it yeah, the other thing about annexation is, and, and pushing west, my, my big beef about that is that it dilutes the votes of the east of 72nd Street um, part of the city. And the, the, I think the whole point of it is to um, facilitate white flight um, and to maintain a, a western white majority as the, as the middle and eastern part of the city diversifies. I read an article a long time ago about like SIDs and racism and yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, it's 156, 177, 186. So yeah, all west of 155th. Right. And, there's, and I looked at the map and they're filling in these little, I call them Swiss cheese holes in the current Omaha map. But district one has Swiss cheese in the 680 loop, like kind of up by Fort. Yeah, there's some totally. places where it's not it's, you're surrounded by Omaha, but there's this little SID that is its own, uh, it's actually Ward or, or District 8. eight. District yeah. Eight. So like, you know, there's seven city council districts. They consider District 8 everything that's not in the other districts. So Swiss cheese, District 8. <laughs> um, so if you care about that, um, items 58 and then 62 through 64 are all about SIDs and annexation. And that's the... Uh, the end of what we had on our list. Does anybody else have anything that they want to bring up, talk about, add, etc.? Yeah, I, I got something. Um, I think there's like stuff brewing around public safety in Omaha, so I wouldn't be surprised to see stuff start to hit council agendas around public safety, policing, and things like that um, soon. So just keep your eye out for that. Definitely. Yeah, that's always, I feel like the things that I just like do a quick scan for, like my first pass when I look at an agenda is like if it involves, well, TIFF, um, but yeah, transportation or police dollars. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly keep an eye out for all that um, and ask questions as we go. But yeah, I think it's going to be interesting because, you know, there's a spike in crime across the country and it's like, well, we have the most money this police department has ever had. And so you can't, you, you have to admit at some point that money does not equal safety. Like, when are we going to be able to, to make that? It's where you put your money. It's, yes, I exactly. Mean, the safest communities are the most well-resourced communities. Like, I think that, I don't know. Oh, and sort of, um, I guess it's kind of a side note, just talking about e-bikes, are we going to allow them on the buses? Oh, yeah. Yep, so we basically um, found out the hard way that you can't take your e-bike on metro buses um and then so then i got in contact with metro and said hey what's up with this policy um it seems kind of silly and unnecessary and could you explain why and they said we don't want bikes blowing up on buses and i said okay right neither do i but show me where that's happened um and they couldn't and so um basically asked them if they could I asked them if they had spoken with any other transit authorities that allowed e-bikes on buses. And they said, no, we've only talked to those that do not. So I was like, could you please have a conversation with someone that does? And they did. And 
Um, so I had a follow-up meeting anyway. So they're changing the policy. So and they have a date for, uh, I guess it's the 13th. I want to say June 13th, they're going to start allowing e-bikes on not just orbit, um, but on the fronts of just regular Metro buses as well. So that is a little win. If you have an e-bike, they want, they want us to bring our e-bikes out to train the drivers or train, I don't know, kind of just show them how we do it they've been doing that the last couple of days at one point they were like we want to collaborate with you and see who is going to um you know do some sort of collaboration with yes getting your e-bikes on the buses and then um i've been kind of playing phone tag with jason rose but it looks like they've already done some so hopefully they got it figured out but the good news is you will be able to to bring whatever kind of bike within within the weight limit i think it's a 55 pound weight limit so that the racks don't crush like that to me was a reasonable you know, ban of like oh. super heavier cargo bikes or whatever. Yeah, many. Can can I put my scooter onto the rack? No. I'm just kidding. I don't even care about a scooter. So I know you don't, <laughs> but for anyone who does, no, you cannot bring scooters on buses. Although we had a we did a car free Midwest interview this morning with a guy from Kansas City and you can bring your scooter on buses and it's fair free in Kansas City. I'm moving to Kansas City. See you later. No. Um did what did you write down here about scooters? Scooters need driver's licenses? Where'd you hear that? I did. So I just downloaded the Spin app and you have to scan in, you have to scan in the barcode on your driver's license. I was kind of thought that was not- That's not good at all. Yeah, but not online. And both of them had me sign in with my Apple ID, which I feel like that has to have, Apple ID has to have some kind of like, you're at least 16 or older. Is there an age limit on the scooters? There is an age limit. Um, and then Manny, there's none in North Omaha, no spins or lines. So I'm emailing much, Derek. <laughs> they very specifically said that in their proposal that they were going to have like an equity emphasis. So yes, they did. Yeah. So yeah. you can CC me on that one. I will. I will. <laughs> and I'll be like, I don't even care about scooters, but that's just, that's, that's racist. Yeah, totally. No. And I'll email him from my mode shift account and make it look legit. I guess that's how I've been communicating with Derek. Hino, Hino from Spin, who's been a pretty decent human, but we did stand up and specifically support them on behalf of Modeship because they said they were going to do a good job. So I'm going to tell them I don't like what I'm seeing so far. All right, cool. I, well, I just want I, to let you know one quick thing. I yeah. um, I wrote an email to the athletic director at UNO because they have a new ballpark across the creek from Baxter Arena now that's quite beautiful, but oh. there are no bike racks. And um, it's right off the Keystone Trail. So I suggested to him after talking to Kevin Carter, who I have to say returned my phone call on the same day I left a message. Yes, Kevin um, Carter, I like him. Yeah, and um, because I wanted not only to, you know, complain, but also offer some ways to actually make it happen. So in my email, I put Kevin's contact information for getting right. bike racks at the ballpark and also um, suggested that um, they work with uh, Betty Foltz at Heartland B-Cycle to locate a station at either Baxter or the new ballpark. Awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, the rabble rousing is always going on. <laughs> That's right. That's excellent. We love to hear it. That's what we're here for. Indeed. All right, cool. Does anybody else have anything to share with the group or we'll see you next week? Well, I was just in New York City and oh. um, uh, well, primarily, we didn't go to Manhattan. We, we hung out in Brooklyn and it's really interesting to see um, a massive city of 8 million people um, with bikes everywhere, uh, bikes being used for transportation a few, there's a few people recreating on bicycles, mm -hmm. but bicycles are a major part of the transportation network there, and they maintain the bike lanes, and um, it's it's really awesome to see. Yeah. So, well, and I'll just add, in Kansas City, people are riding scooters all over the place like that, and the only thing I can think of why it's not like that in Omaha is because we have just like crippled the the rollout of scooters and where they can go and just like made it way more political than it really needs to be. Well, and it's not safe. You know, we haven't done the infrastructure support for the scooters to make them safe to operate. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a pre-programmed fail. You know, it's just like we built this orbit to transport lots of people and a typical orbit station can accommodate about five humans, which 
I think is ridiculous. So, you know, it's just like, well, we don't expect anybody to ever use this stuff. So why make the effort to make it really convenient, safe, and comfortable for people to use? We saw the other day on our way to city council, we saw a police officer on a police bike on the sidewalk. We were in the street, he was on the sidewalk and we were like back and forth like, wait a second, that's illegal. You're like, you're not supposed to be on the sidewalk, but even the police don't feel safe riding it. There are police bikes in uniform right. with a gun in the street. They were on the sidewalk and we're just like, so you get a call. <laughs> I was gonna do a citizen's arrest. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, the more you know. All right, well, I could talk to y'all forever about all sorts of stuff, but I won't until next week. Um, yeah, that's it. Have a good night. Um, maybe we'll see you on Tuesday at council. Otherwise, we'll see you next Thursday at 7.30. Thanks, or good to Saturday see you all. Saturday at 10 at Elmwood Park if you guys want to come out and learn some mode shift stuff. Oh, that's true. Great plug for mode shifts. Yes, indeed. <laughs> We're doing mode shift stuff um, Saturday, 10 o'clock, coffee ride. Manny, will we see you there? Lori, it's in your neighborhood. Johnny, yeah, everyone should come. All right, I'm going to hit stop. It's on, on my calendar.